The game is front and center here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football tonight, a live stream on a Thursday night, 915 Eastern time. We invite you uh, to jump online, give us your comments and questions concerning Ohio State and Michigan and anything in college football as we bring in Steve Hellwagon from 247 Sports. He's the senior Big Ten writer there. Join him specifically on Bucknuts and Steve Dace, Michigan Podcast. Uh, two of my favorite contributors join us on a regular basis and provide uh, just a tremendous uh, job on college football insights. So, man, this is a difficult one to go to uh, either side here. So I'll flip a coin. And uh, hey, Steve, since uh, Steve Hellwagon, that is, since you've had bragging rights in recent years, we'll start with you. Uh, one of the great montages in college football each and every year is, of course, when uh, Ohio State and Michigan are set to kick off at noon Eastern time. I have to remind a lot of people uh, in my sphere of influence uh, when they ask, uh, when, when's the game uh, Saturday? Well, it's always, except one time, it's at noon Eastern time. You should know when the game is. Uh, so when you see the big montage before kickoff with all the, the, um, the memories from uh, recent years and from the distant past, you know, what, what comes to mind first and foremost when you see those, uh, those colors, scarlet and gray and maize and blue, Steve? Oh, tradition, history, great football, championships, Rose Bowls on the line, Bo and Woody. I don't know. There's so many things. Uh, one of the first, I think the very first time I saw an Ohio State Michigan game in person was 1986. And the teams were playing, uh, I believe, Ohio State already clinched a share of the Big Ten championship and had to win to go to the Rose Bowl. And Michigan needed to win to go to the Rose Bowl. And Jim Harbaugh guaranteed victory. And we showed up at the stadium. And it was like 11.30, and the game was going to start a little past 12. And it was like 34 degrees, and there was this steam just kind of rising off the Oladigi River. And you just knew that this was something entirely different at an entirely different level. For 10 weeks, you watched them play Indiana and Illinois and all these other teams. And maybe they won, maybe they lost. I think both teams obviously came in there looking for the Rose Bowl. This was something at an, at an entirely different plane and a different level in terms of the intensity, the physicality. And we'll talk about who won the game that day, but, uh, yeah, that, that was a special memory, even though Ohio State, uh, you know, I was a freshman at Ohio State at the time. Uh, they didn't win the game that day, but I'll never forget that moment. That was uh, – when you see those two colors kind of clash, or those that combination of colors kind of clash, it uh, it does something to you, I guess. Steve Dace, uh, our Ohio State Steve, just alluded to something that I hear all the time for for those people that are very close to the rivalry, and that's it's one of the cleanest but most hard hitting games that you'll ever ever see. Uh, so I'll serve up the same question to you. And basically I could kick back here for the next 45 minutes and let you guys mix it up. I get to talk to you guys all the time about your respective teams. You guys could probably just have a good old time talking to each other. So uh, Michigan, Steve, uh, what comes to mind first and foremost? Well, when Hellwagon was talking about that 86 game, Mark, I, I know it well. Uh, I was in the eighth grade. I probably watched that Michigan Ohio State game more times than any other because uh, it was the first time I ever video recorded a Michigan-Ohio State game. Uh, the opening montage that CBS Sports does with the Rocky theme uh, and the long version of the Rocky theme with the cool bridge and stuff in the middle, you know, and really uh, the highlighting of, of both schools. For, for 1986, you can find that game, by the way, for our viewers that want to know what we're talking about. You can, you can find that game in its full broadcast on YouTube right now. And you go and watch that, and you look at the graphics, you look at the setup, and you will not believe that as a broadcast from now 32 years ago. It, it, it looks very much like the kind of stuff we see today. I go back to the 100th game, Keith Jackson. I think that might have been the last Michigan-Ohio State game he called. Uh, and that, We had the game in the, in the big house, the 100th anniversary of it, and the montage and, and the atmosphere for that. I've been to one Michigan and Ohio State game uh, as a fan. I went actually in 1999. Uh, which was Tom Brady's last home game at Michigan Stadium. It turned out to be a down year for Ohio State. But 
Michigan was a huge favorite and had to pull that game out at the end uh, in order to get a BCS bowl bid at the end. And that's 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 sort of the history of the rivalry uh, is that the underdog prevails or at least scares the living hell out of the favorite more times than not. And you mentioned how clean the game is. You know, there's been a lot of pregame bravado where this game over the years has been concerned. There was a, an instance, I think, uh, the 2013 game in Ann Arbor where an Ohio State player got ejected and the Michigan crowd kind of gave him uh, the business on the way out. So it was kind of not a good look for either side. But other than that, you know, I've been a Michigan fan. It's my 35th year now as a Michigan fan since I was 10 years old. Other than that, it's amazing. You know, you'll see it coming out of the tunnel. You'll see, you know, uh, jaw, you know, jaw slapping and smack talking. You know, Walter Smith, you know, back in the day saying, we just want to keep beating Ohio State to get uh, John Cooper fired. Terry Glenn said, you know, Michigan doesn't matter anymore. Michigan's irrelevant. Who are they? You know, uh, the Marcus Ray and uh, Charles Woodson back and forth with David Boston. And that's one time I can remember that it actually did spill out onto the field. But for the most part, you know, Woody in 73, the year I was born, tunnel uh, crashed in the MGO Blue Banner. But except for that one altercation with Woodson and with Boston uh, and what happened a few years ago, for the most part, despite the fact this might be the nastiest robbery in terms of the fan bases in college football, or certainly right there with an Alabama-Auburn, once the game kicks off, you really do see two programs that just um, have are powerful brands, uh, represent Midwestern values and sort of that salt of the earth sort of thing. And and I think you see that play out in that you don't usually see a lot of fouls in this game and those sorts of things. And I think that really kind of speaks to what makes this rivalry so special. You don't have the honor or the legacy of an Army Navy, but in terms of secular universities and, and the values of the part of the country they represent, this is pretty much the pinnacle. It's a good point. I always distinguish Army Navy. That's a different category for obvious reasons. Let's not sure. even put anyone or a any two programs in that same uh, vicinity. But Ohio State, Michigan, uh, that even spills beyond college football. That's that's ranked with the greatest rivalries in sports. And Ohio State, Steve, uh, as a uh, uh, Michigan Steve there uh, talks about his memories and just his overall thoughts about the rivalry. It seems to be clumped into eras. If you know Ohio State, Michigan, regardless of the perspective, uh, you know, the John Cooper era when Michigan dominated. Before that, it was obviously a tug of war back and forth with the 80s uh, and was established in terms of a modern era, obviously with a 10 year war and then Trestle and Urban Meyer dominating in the last 15 years. So it's it's had its eras. And, and again, seriously, guys, I'm going to let um, uh, Steve Hellwagon take it from here and then I'll, I'll let you guys just go back and forth because this will be great stuff. I'll, I'll learn something here. So, Steve, just your yeah. thoughts about the different eras. Definitely. And, and I, I can tell you, I mean, you're talking about two football programs, Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan, Ohio State. I think Michigan may be number one all time in terms of victories, and Ohio State's in the top five, even though they had a whole season uh, theoretically wiped away by the NCAA because of sanctions in 2010, and including a win over Michigan that, uh, you know, some people count it, the NCAA and the schools probably don't. But uh, at any rate, uh, a rivalry of two of obviously the best football programs in the country, the two greatest football programs in the Big Ten, Michigan, 42 Big Ten championships. Ohio State's closed the gap in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, now has 36 after winning it this past season, uh, winning the championship game. So, um, you know, this is something to think about. Um, as of today, I jotted this down, Michigan officially has the lead, 58 wins, 49 losses and six ties. That does not include that 2010 game that was vacated by the sanctions. So uh, from when uh, John Cooper left in 2000, uh, Ohio State was 21 games under 500 to University of Michigan at that point. Today they're nine, and if you count that game that you know some count, some don't, they're eight. So they've made up a tremendous amount of ground. And the only other thing I will throw out there when you're talking about eras is, okay, they had a lead of 21 games at one point, and now it's down to eight or nine, however you want to quantify it. When this series began in 1897, 
Uh, they played 15 times before Ohio State ever won for the first time in 1919. Chick Harley, uh, who was a great football player, you know, the Heisman didn't come along till the 30s, I guess. They say Chick Carley would have won it if there had been one in 1919. But this rivalry began prior to that. Michigan was 13 wins, zero losses, and two ties against Ohio State to start it out. So I don't know, guys. I'm going to say the modern era of college football began in 1919. And since then, Ohio State's had a very clear uh, advantage of, I don't know, four or five games, <laughs> whatever it might be. But it's fun to laugh about that, uh, you know, Michigan has boasted about this great advantage in the series, which 21 game lead in the series is amazing at one point. And now Ohio State's whittled it down to single figures. And uh, who knows what the next four or five years, uh, if Urban Meyer sticks it out, how long he'll be there and, and how much closer to 500 Ohio State will get. Yeah, I look, uh, Mark, my time uh, as a Michigan fan watching this uh, both firsthand and then uh, retrospectively, and for me, retrospectively, it starts with the 10-year war, Woody versus, versus Bo, from 1969 to 1978. Uh, during that era, uh, Bo, it was 5-4-1 and one in favor of Michigan. But uh, what Bo had to do those last three years, uh, and it was really kind of the downward slide of, Woody's uh, career at the end, and of course, culminating with what happened in the Gator Bowl. And ironically, one of the few coaches that came to his defense after that was actually Bo Schembechler. Uh, but the last three years, Michigan had to beat Ohio State three years in a row, hold them without an offensive touchdown in those three, in those final three games of the 10 year war in order to get to five, four, and one uh, in that era. And even if you're an Ohio State fan, you should go get. Go get Hey, Steve Hellwagon. Can you hear Steve Dace? I think he locked up on us, and hopefully he'll come back here very soon. So, um, I, can, I can, He dropped out the. Yeah, so he dropped out for both of us. I just wanted yeah. to make sure it wasn't me. So uh, we'll wait for Steve Dace to come back on. But uh, Steve, uh, talking about uh, the John Cooper eras, obviously, I can't think of a coaching career in college football that has the negative connotations that John Cooper's does. But at the same time, if you could reverse two or three games, a mere two or three over the course of about 150 career games at Ohio State, it would completely change the narrative uh, for John Cooper. Yeah, um, that was kind of in my wheelhouse. Uh, he was the coach my last two years as a student there. And uh, pretty much I picked it up in 1988, started covering the, the team as a student and then uh, <clears throat> professionally after that. And uh, those were difficult times, 2 10 and one, no question about it. And, and Mark, the thing that, that makes it even worse were the stakes were so incredibly, incredibly high when the teams played. Uh, Michigan denied Ohio State uh, the Rose Bowl in 1990, uh, kicked a field goal in the last play and won the game. 1992, the, the teams played to a tie, and it had no impact because Michigan had already clinched the championship in the Rose Bowl, but after four uh, just miserable losses under John Cooper, to finally get a tie in 1992 at Ohio Stadium, everybody remembers Gordon Gee was the president of uh, the Ohio State University at the time, referred to it as our greatest win. <laughs> <laughs> and Ohio State had to go for two after a, a fourth down touchdown pass with Kirk Herbstreet I think he threw the ball to Greg Beatty, the one year Kirk Herbstreit started at the quarterback position for Ohio State in 1992, completed a touchdown. They went for two and they got it to get it to 13 to 13. And uh, one of the last great ties in Ohio State history uh, before they finally went to the overtime rules uh, later there in the decades. I think 97 was the first full season where it was in place. I think it was in place for the bowl games in 96. Had they had a tie game. But going on, I mean, 93 Ohio State was undefeated with a tie against Washington. That denied them the Rose Bowl, losing up there, not only losing 28 to nothing they lost. I mean, it was a miserable, miserable defeat. 
uh, 95, Ohio State was undefeated. You touched on a little bit, Terry Glenn. Charles Woodson, the freshman, I believe he had two interceptions in that game, 31 to 23. And then, of course, uh, 96 at Ohio Stadium, uh, the team's uh, Ohio State was undefeated, uh, lost 13 to 9, didn't score a touchdown in that game, got inside the 10 yard line twice in the first half and had to settle for touchdowns. Ohio State had already clinched the Big Ten, was going to the Rose Bowl, but they needed that win uh, to win the national championship. Florida ultimately won the national championship with one loss. Had Ohio State won that game and beaten Arizona State, John Cooper would have been a national championship coach at Ohio State, and on and on and on. It it went throughout uh, the rest of uh, that decade, but uh, Obviously, uh, Jim Trestle's arrival in 2001 singled kind of a change uh, for that rivalry and really a change for Ohio State football. Uh, it became the centerpiece of the football program to win that game. Uh, you know, they Ohio State would win that game under Jim Trestle, and they'd say, okay, well, you're going to go on and play Miami in the Fiesta Bowl for the national championship. And, and I kid you not, Jim Trestle would sit there with a straight – Straight look on his face, and he would say, well, we, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Today was about the Michigan game and the greatest rivalry, not only in college football, but in all of sports. And <laughs> everyone was like, right on, man. You got it. Well, you know, it meant going on to play for a national championship. And, you know, Ohio State has, has solved to a big degree the Michigan problem that they had for uh, low those many years. But, uh, you know, I tell people now who take it for granted, Ohio State's won uh, 15 of the last 17 games against Michigan, uh, to never take that for granted because I did live through that period <laughs> from 1988 to 2000 when it was dominated by the University of Michigan. And uh, we all know that uh, – there's reasons why Ohio State is dominating now. A lot of it has to do with recruiting Urban Meyer and different things of that nature. But, uh, you know, things can change and do change over time. Yeah, Jim Trestle, of course, famously uh, saying at uh, the introductory uh, of his uh, tenure there at Ohio State, at least for the fans at the basketball game, that you're going to be proud of uh, this Ohio State football team in X number of days, whatever the number of days was he named, like 350 days, uh, and said you're going to be proud of them when they walk across the stage and, and receive their diploma, and you're going to be proud of them in 350 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, of course, Ohio State went up, up there and pulled off uh, the upset with some great defense and special teams uh, on that day. And um, trying to think who the, um, the running back was that uh, had a huge – Jonathan Wells. Jonathan from, Wells. Thank you. Yeah, you have to kind of think about it because they had uh, a Maurice Wells, a Jonathan Wells, <laughs> a Chris Beanie Wells, and uh, then they've also had several other guys named Maurice. Uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, a lot of name uh, recognition there, but Jonathan Wells was outstanding running back for Ohio State in that uh, 2001 season. And uh, Jim Trestle went into that game with kind of a freewheeling mind and not that they were going to throw the ball over the field uh, because um, uh, Craig Krenzel was making his first career start uh, in that game against Michigan and uh, filling in uh, Steve Belisari, uh, the, the team captain, had been not necessarily – I would say he was suspended for the Illinois game I believe he was on the sideline for the Michigan game and did not play uh, after a drunken driving arrest, which is another footnote, kind of, uh, you know, in Ohio State lore that Craig Krenzel, you know, was the third string quarterback that season. We may never have found out about him. You know, that national championship in 2002 may never have happened had uh, had he not risen to the forefront, including that Michigan game. But they went for it on fourth down, fourth and one at about the 40-yard line. And Jonathan Wells took the handoff and exploded through a big hole and raced into the end zone. I think they got out to a 20 to nothing lead or, or something like that and held on for dear life. 26 23, I think, was the final score. And uh, the Buckeyes uh, got, or 26 20, perhaps, they got out of Ann Arbor with uh, just, uh, you know, first time they had won there since the Earl Bruce game in 87, a span of 14 years they had gone to Michigan every other year and come away with a loss. So uh, Steve Dace, 
Ohio State, Steve, just brings up a fourth and one. Uh, Jim Trestle's first year going to Ann Arbor and winning. I think of another fourth and one situation. John Cooper is head coach at Ohio State uh, and Gary Moeller at Michigan at the shoe where the Buckeyes needed a win to go to the Rose Bowl. And uh, it was a tie ball game in 1990 and uh, Ohio State ran an option play with Greg Fry in its own end and needing a first down to keep the drive alive and they needed to win. A tie was fine for Michigan, but uh, the Wolverines stopped them, kicked the field goal and, and won the game to go to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I missed what you guys were talking about beforehand. Literally, as it came my turn to talk about the recent history of the rivalry, my computer died, and if that's not a damn metaphor, fellas, I don't know what is, okay? <laughs> so my, my apologies right there. But you mentioned that 1990 game. I was a senior in high school. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, the option call. And if I remember right, um, Iowa was playing Minnesota that night. You had a four-way tie in 1990. Uh, Michigan State, Michigan, uh, Illinois, and Iowa ended up tying for the title. So Iowa had already clinched a share of the Big Ten championship. Uh, in order for them to secure the Rose Bowl berth, they needed either Ohio State to lose or they needed to win in Minneapolis. Uh, and so I think uh, that Iowa went on and lost that game at Minnesota at the end of that night. And if Ohio State had just played for the tie, they would have gone to the Rose Bowl, if I remember that right. But yeah, you know, John Cooper at the time not, did not know right. that. They, they had a yeah, tie th had themselves on their record against Indiana that right. year. And, and Cooper um, obviously didn't know that at noon Easter, you know, so... He went for the win in his own end. It blew up in his face. What's that? Throw one thing in there about that. Went to a bar after that game in Columbus, and we're watching, you know, how Arizona and Arizona State always played on that same day, their rivalry game later on. And one of them is just beating the other one like a drum. And my buddy, I can't recall which one was winning, which one. It's immaterial. He – Every time the one team kept scoring, he, he would look at me and he would say, that, that's what you do to your rival. That's what you do to your rival. <laughs> we were sitting there fanning the flames. Of well, ironically, it was Arizona, Arizona State, of course, yes. where John Cooper uh, had been. Yeah. Went to the Rose Bowl and beat Michigan. And then Ohio State hires him thinking, now nah, we need the guy that knows how to beat uh, the team up north. Let's bring him in. And then he goes two and ten. Didn't go very well. <laughs> so I mean, sorry. That game really. That, no, that's okay. That game really established Moeller's uh, tenure at Michigan because uh, the first season he had an enormously talented team. Uh, Bo left him with a young team, yeah, young guys that would go on to be stars: Derek Alexander, uh, Ricky Powers, Elvis Gerbach, uh, Desmond Howard, uh, uh, Eric Anderson, who would go on to be Michigan's only Butkus Award winner. I mean, he left, Bo left Gary Moeller stacked. Uh, and that team actually got to number one in the country earlier in the year and then went, went into that Ohio State game with three losses. Uh, and, and so Moeller needed a huge win uh, in order to establish himself uh, as the Michigan coach. And he got it that day. Uh, and, you know, John Cooper and the decision he made there with running the, the option with Greg Fry. I, I didn't have a problem with them going for it. I didn't understand running the option with Greg Fry. <laughs> to me, that's too smart by a half. But there, there's, a, there's a history of that uh, throughout this rivalry. And, and these sorts of moments produce that. And even though in recent years, guys, we've had these, these huge ebbs and flows, you go back to the 10-year war, it was 5-4-1. Uh, and and that, was just, that was including Michigan just dominating the last three years, going 3-0, and not allowing an offensive touchdown to Ohio State, shutting them out in Columbus in 76. And they had to do that to get to 5-4-1. You know, Earl Bruce, I don't have to tell Mr. Hellwagon about uh, the criticisms he received. I, Mark, you and I talked in the past, uh, later in Earl's life when he took over the local arena football team here in Iowa, Earl and I got to be good buds several years ago. So I heard a lot of great Ohio State and Ohio State-Michigan stories from him. But old 9-3 and three Earl actually had a winning record against Bo Schembechler, as I recall. I think he was 5-4. and four. Uh, yep. He won that last game in 1987, and that was a big upset. In fact, I, I remember Bo saying that week when, when uh, Earl got fired, because he was already kind of flirting with the idea of retiring. He had just become Michigan's AD as well. And he's like, well, maybe I'll just retire right now and hire Earl Bruce to be my football coach here at Michigan if Ohio State doesn't want him. And so you take those two eras aside, and then we had the Michigan dominance of 10-2-1-1. And now we're in the dark period, as we like to call it, uh, it around the maze of blue. And that is uh, one out of 14. And just to show you how depressing it is, 
My 11-year-old son lives and dies with the Michigan Wolverines. He does not understand why this is a big game. You know what I mean? It just, in his lifetime, it, it really hasn't meant much. I mean, it's been largely cannon fodder for Ohio State football seasons. And it doesn't, it, he doesn't understand what guys our age and older understand this is really about. Because in the time frame that he's been around, it's just been, uh, you know, Ohio State either dominates or finds a way to win. And I went and looked this up on signing day back in February, and it really just made me want to cut myself. Mm. The kids who signed in February with the class of 2018 have seen, in their lifetimes, they have seen Purdue beat Michigan in football more often than Michigan has defeated Ohio State. And I'm going to take a drink of Cherry Coke Zero now because that makes me sad. <laughs> yeah. Let me, if I may, I want to throw in, you talked about how the 90 team established uh, perhaps Gary Moeller after he followed uh, Bo Schimbeckler. Well, everybody knows Gary Moeller was an Ohio State grad and had right. worked there and, and so on and so forth and became the head coach, then lost the job leading into the 95 season, had the incident in Ann Arbor, and they put Lloyd Carr, who'd been the beautiful assistant there forever, they shove him in there somewhat as the interim coach for the 95 season, and it was kind of an up-and-down year. I think they yep. beat Virginia in his first game. They yeah, threw, I was at that game. Yep. Threw a touchdown pass on the very last play of the game, and I think won like 17-16 uh, or 18-17, whatever. 18-17, to 17. Yep. yeah. Just a you know amazing debut. Well, then he goes on. And at the end of the season, here's Ohio State. This is one of the greatest Ohio State teams they ever fielded. You had Bobby Hoying, who was a 3,000-yard passer at quarterback. Uh, you had uh, Eddie George, who won the Heisman Trophy. You had Terry Glenn, who won the Bolitnikoff Award and ended up playing about 13 years in the NFL, just as Eddie George did. You had Orlando Pace, who's now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, at left tackle. Uh, you had on uh, the defense, you had Mike Vrabel, who was an All-American. Uh, just uh, Sean Springs. He was definitely a tight end on that team, right? Another high draft pick? What's that? And Rick, Ricky Dudley, another Dudley high draft pick was a tight end. Yeah, the tight end. So you had – Yep. What I think Ohio State fans generally consider in terms of talent, uh, they were undefeated, 11-0 uh, and 0 because they played Boston College in the kickoff classic. I mean, think about this schedule. They opened that year Boston College, came back home and beat Washington. Uh, there may have been a Pittsburgh game at Pittsburgh in the middle then, and then they beat Notre Dame. Think about that. That's outside the Big Ten. They beat Boston College, Washington. Uh, Pittsburgh and Notre Dame, and none of them were particularly close. I mean, I think the Washington game may have been like 30 to 20. Otherwise, they blew the rest of them out. And that's before they got into the Big Ten and started beating everybody 42 to 3 each week. Well, come to find out, they get to Michigan and uh, Lloyd Carr, interim coach, hanging by a thread. Is he going to get this job or not? And Tim Biak, perhaps the greatest uh, individual performance in the I believe Steve Hellwagen is uh, taking his turn to lock up. So we're even at one to one. So, so, so Steve, uh, maybe the history maybe we'll, we'll leave the floor. Oh, yeah. he's back. No, he was, he was talking about Bianca Batuka's 313 yards rushing, which was a, yeah. uh, a Michigan, Ohio state record uh, at that time. That was it. Saturday after Thanksgiving game. And I think the point you're going to make, Steve, before you kind of buffered out on us, is that sort of established Lloyd Carr as the yes. Michigan head coach as well. And you're exactly correct about that. Yeah. yeah, what happened is we're in the car leaving Ann Arbor and we're listening to their post game report. And they immediately came out and said, he's been extended. He's the new head coach. He is mm -hmm. the head coach that single day, that one moment. And then what happens two years later? Uh, they win the national championship or a share of it, however you want to say it. They were the national champions in 97. They in Nebraska, another great Big Ten football program. And so, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, legends are made in this game. They talked for a long time at Ohio State. They'd have reunions. And, uh, you know, you get a pair of gold pants for beating uh, the University of Michigan when you're at Ohio State. And they'd say, well, how many times did you beat them? 
And those poor guys from the, the coupe era would have to say, oh, we never did. And then these guys would hold up pendants with three and four of them. <laughs> it's like, you know, you didn't play here unless you beat them. You, you're you not accepted as a member of our society as a successful Ohio State football player unless you beat the University of Michigan. So I'm guessing that both of you have seen the documentary in the Big Ten Network uh, that chronicles the 1973 decision in which yeah, there's a 10-10 tie. Those poor people. And I'm not going to take uh, everybody through it out there. Look it up. It's a tremendous documentary, and it just really dives into the politics and the war that was waged uh, uh, away from the field regarding Ohio State and Michigan, tying for a Big Ten championship, tying on the field, Michigan outplaying Ohio State in the second half of that game, and the politics involved with the Buckeyes being selected despite going to the Rose Bowl the previous season for another Pasadena trip to take on USC. But he didn't win many Rose Bowls, but he did go on and win that one, I think, over USC. So, yes. In the end, it was all valid. Yeah, that was, that was when Denny Franklin got hurt in the second half, broke his collarbone. Uh, as Michigan came back to forge a tie, Mike Lantry, a Vietnam vet, who was pretty much a money kicker at Michigan, uh, except for two games. Uh, and it was the Ohio State, his junior and senior year. Uh, he missed a couple of field goals in 73. Then they had the field goal down, at, at, was it 72 in Columbus? that every Michigan fan still believes is good. And I'll tell you what, when you watch the replay of that game in 72, it does look like that field goal. <laughs> he kicks there. It does look like it's good. But, you know, that game changed Big Ten history because from 1972 to 1974, Michigan went 32-1, and one, shared the Big Ten championship every year, and didn't go to a bowl game because the Big Ten only allowed teams uh, that were going to the Rose Bowl were the only teams allowed – to play in the postseason. And then after that uh, vote in 1973, uh, the rule was changed. And in 1976, Michigan, or 1975, Michigan became the first team to play in a, in a bowl game uh, other than the Rose Bowl uh, when they went on and took on Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl after losing to Ohio State uh, in, uh, uh, in Ann Arbor on an interception return for a touchdown by Archer Griffin's little brother, if I remember that one right. And, and that, and so that was the era and that those were the stakes that, you know, people were playing for back then, which, you know, I think we kind of lost that for a long time because uh, the league's been more wide open. You had shared chance, shared championships. Now that we have this pure playoff championship game though, I think we're getting back to that notion of it's live or die. It, you, there's no other way you have to go through your, your rival uh, and there's no shared championships 14 teams enter every August and one man leaves, right? And so I think we're kind of back to that drama that we saw perennially uh, during those Bow and Woody years uh, uh, in, in that 10-year war. And you mentioned the politics, Mark. You know, if you go and you can watch this documentary, I actually own it on my shelf here, but you can watch all this stuff on YouTube now. The retrospective that the Michigan Athletic Department did with Bo after he retired. And when he went back and remembered that vote in 73, now, they're taping this 16 years later, okay? And Bo is seething like this just freaking happened last week. Yep. I mean, he's, he, and he admitted he let, the, he let the hate for that moment. He found out about that, by the way. Here's how there's a great description in the WDIV in Detroit on Sunday morning to tape his coach's show. And all the press is gathered around this TV studio in pitch black November. He's like, why are all these media people here? And they're like, hey, did you hear about the vote? He's like, uh, what vote? That's how we found out. All right. And he had to go in and tape his TV show right off of hearing that. And, and in his book, he says, Wayne Duke, who was the commissioner of the Big Ten back then, who passed away a couple of years ago. He said, I have called Wayne Duke a lot of names since then. If this book was longer, I'd call him some more. OK. And, and he says in his, doc, in, the, in, the, in his retrospective documentary, he said, the hatred for what they did to his team in that moment. He said he let that fuel him the rest of his career, that if there was ever a time he didn't want to make a recruiting visit, he wanted to slow down, wanted to cut practice short, he remembered that moment, he remembered that vote, and they would never let that happen to one of his teams ever again. Oh, it's beautifully stated. It's a great quote, and, and you can just feel the venom and, and the intensity uh, emanating from Bo when he, when he mentions that and thinks back uh, uh, 15 or 16 years. It, it's really good stuff. I'll, I'll throw in a, a, a kind of a take on what Steve was talking about really quick, Mark, uh, how when these teams met 
for any number of years, uh, 80s, 90s, in a lot of these cases, it was, you know, the best team in the Big Ten against the other best team in the Big Ten with the Rose Bowl on the line, Big Ten championship, et cetera, so much, a, a potential chance to win the national championship if you could win out. All of that stuff was on the line, not every season, not every season, but there were a lot of them where the winner of that game was poised to go on and go to the Rose Bowl. Uh, I brought up 86 earlier uh, was certainly that way when Jim Harbaugh guaranteed the victory and, and delivered on it. Uh, you know, you go on down through the, the various years that, that when they decided themselves, it has been some of the most compelling football. Uh, I think about uh, two games here that that we've all you know seen here in the last decade or so, uh, 2006 when uh, Ohio State was ranked number one and Michigan was ranked number two, and the teams played in Columbus, and Ohio State held on and won the game 42 to 39. Troy Smith was the Heisman Trophy winner, one versus two. Um, unprecedented. It had never, I guess, uh, Michigan and Iowa had played in the Chuck Long year uh, when mm -hmm. uh, one versus two, and it was a 12 to 10 game, I think, uh, in that one. Uh, that I believe Iowa won because they went on and played Ohio State after that, and Ohio State upset them. But uh, and then to come in full circle in 85, uh, that season, uh, Michigan defeats Ohio State, uh, you know, in the season finale. So uh, just so many scenarios like that. Uh, I mentioned 2006, uh, just two amazing teams, although neither of them would go on from that game and win their bowl game, uh, as we saw. I think USC beat Michigan in the Rose Bowl. Urban Meyer and Florida decimated Ohio State in the uh, BCS championship game and then of course the game uh, just uh coming up two years ago in uh 2016 where it was number two against number three in columbus and for the first time ever the rivalry went to overtime ohio state won the game in double overtime and uh went on obviously uh that season so uh, i believe that was the year they went on uh didn't get to uh play in the big 10 championship because they had lost to penn state but they were rewarded with the playoff berth, and as my recollection serves, I believe Michigan, had they won the game, would have gone to the championship game. So uh, they denied Michigan that uh, two versus three game, double overtime. You want to talk about the suspense and the drama. An Ohio State-Michigan game hinging on a field goal to go to overtime, and the guy's already missed a field goal. He already missed a chip shot field goal, and, and they forced the overtime and then uh, obviously uh, win the game in overtime, but uh, or double overtime. Uh, just some dramatic, dramatic football where, you know, you have uh, – there's probably 13, 14 million people in the state of Ohio. I'm going to guess 8 to 10 million in the state of Michigan, whatever the population is. You have two states of people – Whatever the stakes are that on that given day, everything has come to a complete standstill from noon to four on that Saturday in November. And everybody, you know, if you want to go grocery shopping or if you want to, want to get anything done, that's the time to go out and do it because both states have come to an absolute standstill to watch that game. Guys, it was sometime in the early 80s that the paperweight came uh, ringing the doorbell, um, maybe sometime during the third quarter of the Ohio State-Michigan game. And my dad, who was as mild-mannered and as friendly as could be, just shook his head and just stared at the kid and said, do you see the streets? Do, do you know what's going on right now? Do you understand? <laughs> and he basically just kind of just uh, kind of slammed the door on his face and <laughs> probably apologized the next day. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, I'm going to leave you guys and leave you with one parting shot each of uh, what's the gut wrenching moment that still sticks, still sticks with you and still stings. And, and what still brings a smile to your face and is still captures your heart in, in this series. So, Steve Dace, we'll start with you. Um, I, the history and legacy uh, of the the series deuced um i just i was i was just yesterday watching the actual broadcast of the 1993 game 
And we beat Ohio State that day, 28 to nothing. They were number five in the country. They were playing for a shot in the Rose Bowl. And we had a team that was six and four. And I counted like 14 guys in Michigan's starting lineup that were drafted or started a football game in the NFL. And I'm trying to figure out how the hell that team was six and four. Okay. Uh, but it was like Michigan their entire season by the way that they did. And I think that aspect of the rivalry, you know, I know Earl died just a couple of months ago and, and listening and remembering some of the stories he used to tell me about Woody. Uh, and as a, Mich as a Michigan fan, I'm fascinated by them, just like they're fascinated by us. And getting to know him uh, late in, later in his coaching career and being around him and how surreal it was for me as a kid growing up in Michigan and hating Ohio State, but loving this guy um, and hearing and love being having him regale me with his stories. Those are the moments that I've thought a lot about it over the last couple of months since he passed away. Those are the things that still bring a smile to my face. But I will say this. As I get older, I'm not conspiracy guy. I'm not blame the refs guy. Mark, you've gotten to know me fairly well over the last year or two. I'm not really much for spin for my team. I don't, I don't like victimology. I decry it in my day job, so I certainly don't bring it into the sporting arena. You know, to me, there's no argument scoreboard doesn't win. All right? Just score more points next time, right? It's like Ohio State fan Drew Carey once said to the Native Americans, fight harder next time. Okay, you don't like the way things turned out. I don't like excuses, okay? But that 2016 game, I can't watch it. I won't tune into it. It's like it didn't happen. Um, I have to commend Ohio State for what must be the greatest pass-blocking performance in a game when you gave up eight damn sacks in the history of intercollegiate football. Michigan got eight sacks and somehow didn't get one holding call the entire game that went into double overtime. It's amazing. Eight times Michigan got lucky and got home. And on all of the other pass plays, Mark, Ohio State, including that one play where Curtis Samuel, I believe, went back and forth on both sides of the field twice. No flags. That's amazing. That game I can't watch. I'm, and I know that if you're an Ohio State fan, there's that game, and you can pull that out, right? You just can't whether it's a coaching decision or a ref's call or some mind-numbed play, and you can't watch it, all right? That 2016 game, I'm still a broken man from that game. When it comes on BTN, I can't, I, I can't relive it. And so um, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm bitter about that game. You didn't want to play Clemson. Just <laughs> <laughs> That part's probably true. That you part's probably true. Clemson. Hey. But, but but you know but Steve we are from a we're from a region and from an era when yeah. if you won that game it really didn't matter what you did in the postseason well, your fans barely remember that right Michigan so, wins that game just think where Jim Harbaugh is and the Michigan program are today and the credibility for him to have come yeah, into totally different and yep. won a game like that it changes the course of college football and the rivalry as we know it no Instead, doubt he's no still doubt. over. So, Steve Dace, yep. when your and line dropped, that, Hellwagon and I were talking about. Yeah, so Hellwagon and I were talking about. We were talking about uh, John Cooper's legacy. And if you flip in, in 150 games at Ohio State, if you flip one or two against Michigan, the whole narrative of his career changes. And Michigan fans obviously hoping that the same doesn't hold true in the retrospect of Jim Harbaugh's career in five or six years. You're right. uh, and, and, and that right. would be the first I mean, one that uh, could easily be flipped. And you could say, okay, suddenly Michigan's a Big Ten champ. They're in a playoff. And then who knows what? Mark, take two plays. Two plays. The punt snap botched against Michigan State, Jimmy's first year. And then if they hold him short uh, against Ohio State, those two plays, if they go differently, how much different is the entire plan of the Michigan football program right now? And so that's why that game broke me, because when you're dealing with Urban Meyer, you're dealing with a top 10 all-time coach. It's still in the prime of his career at an elite school. You're only going to get so many chances. You've got Michigan State down the road with a Hall of Fame coach, probably on the downside of his career, but still proved last year that he is a, he's a formidable presence. You've got James Franklin that has somehow, I have no idea how Penn State has recovered quicker from a child predator on campus than Michigan did from Rich Rodriguez and Brady Hope. That's a, that's a great mystery to me, but it is what it is. It's, it's what's happening. And, the, and the, the Penn State program is back to national prominence as well. And that's why the 2016 game was so important 
Because when you've got this convergence of, of teams all in one division like this, you're only going to get so many chances to beat all of those other guys. And when you've got a fourth and one, and your entire and your entire defensive line is the National Football League right now, you got to make that stop, man. And you, we can we can talk about the spot, what have you. But you've got it. That's those are the plays that make the difference. And you can see the relief on Urban Meyer's face after the game. He knew what he he's a guy that's built programs. He knew what was at stake. And, and so in these sorts of rivalries, it is that, that one play, the Greg Fry. If, if Greg Fry gets that first down, what's the entire rest of the legacy of John Cooper if Ohio State goes to the Rose Bowl in only his third season? It's, maybe it's totally different. We don't know. Mm -hmm. On that uh, 2016, I want to tell you uh, just the way it was working out. I was up in the uh, interview room waiting for the Ohio State press conference and getting ready to file my – story that way because I knew if if they won it would be a madhouse trying to get to it and they had the stadium feed which had the camera back on the 50 yard line looking toward the would have been the northeast corner of the stadium it was a bad angle whereas the ESPN camera was roughly on or about the uh, yard the line of scrimmage and my first blush when I saw it was he didn't get it that's the very first thing I said because of the camera angle as much as anything, because you, from where I was sitting on that camera angle, he doesn't even begin to get close to the line to gain. Then when they flipped it and I was able to see the television feed, it was much closer, obviously. And I don't think uh, short of having a sensor in the football and having, you know, like you have on the golf course with uh, the GPS tracking, I don't think anybody knows if that ball ever uh, broached the 15 yard line or not. It doesn't matter. They called it good, and they replayed it good, and whatever. But uh, I'll throw in my gut punch in my smile game. Gut punch was 86, I think, for me, although the stakes, you know, no national championship was at stake. Maybe the bigger one in that regard was 96. To lose at home to that team, I think Michigan had lost at Purdue the week before going into that 96 game and did not score a touchdown. That was it with with what should have been a national championship caliber team that year in '96, losing at home. That was the ultimate, uh, uh, just dark, dark day. And you couldn't have asked for such a nice day that day. We were driving out of the stadium, and the sun was setting in the west. And I was just like, "Good lord, they ruined a perfect day. They just ruined a perfect day with that result, losing in '96." And it, in terms of exhilaration, 87 up there to see Earl go out as a winner. And then 2016, I would say uh, 2002, when they beat Michigan to go play Miami for the national championship. You know, Ohio State hasn't won the national championship in 35 years. When that game is over, Will Allen intercepts the, the – I think it was John Navarre was the quarterback, intercepts the last pass. Those It's an eight-foot drop. And those people came from every direction as fast as they possibly could and took over that field because it was an enormous, momentous event. I would say looking down from the press box on that one, that was an all-time classic in terms of what it meant for Ohio State. The state of Ohio, Jim Trestle, just to finally, after all the stops and starts, to get over that hump, and now they're playing Miami, the invincible Miami, for the national championship. Uh, that was an exhilarating moment. It's Rivalry Month here at Mark Rogers TV, and I've made a colossal mistake. Uh, I need to go with Rivalry Month for everyone else, and then just Ohio State Michigan Month is what I need to do, <laughs> and maybe we'll make that correction uh, next year because uh, we could talk Ohio State Michigan, the game, Michigan, Ohio State for you Wolverine fans, of course, uh, as we discuss uh, what I believe is the greatest rivalry in college football. And uh, I know that there was an ABC graphic uh, several years ago that I saw that was backing up with facts because, of course, the passion cannot be argued. It's in your corner of the college football universe, regardless of whether it's USC, UCLA, Washington, Washington State, on and on and on. But in terms of rear ends in the seats and eyes on the TV sets, uh, they came up with some metrics all time that measured Ohio State, Michigan as the greatest rivalry in regards to national exposure mm. and attention. 
All right, Steve Dace, Michigan Podcast, joins us on a regular basis. Does a fabulous job, not, not just covering uh, Michigan football, but uh, the landscape of college football. And, of course, Steve Hellwagon from uh, 247 Sports, the uh, a Big Ten senior writer there for Bucknuts. Uh, guys, it, it was very enjoyable. I, I enjoyed every minute of, of it uh, traveling down memory lane with both of you. Yes, enjoyed it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.